get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Peter, and I'm the marketing manager at Spyrec, and I will be your host throughout the session. Today, we are presenting tips and strategies on how to select the right inlet works equipment, presented by Bruce Crawley, our screen and grid product expert. Uh, we will cover a wide range of uh, inlet works equipment, starting off with a selection of coarse and fine screens, different screening and washing and dewatering options, grid capture and washing, and and also possible storage and transport solutions. Last but not least, we will show InletWorks examples we designed and manufactured in previous years. Before uh, I hand over to Bruce, I would like to do a little housekeeping before we get started. Today's session uh, is being hosted in the Zoom webinar platform, uh, and you are in a listen and view only mode. So when you check your audio settings, you all, uh, all you really need to do is um, worry about your speaker settings. So make sure everything's at a comfortable volume level. Maybe put in some headphones if you like. You want to have uh, to worry about your microphone or video settings as you are, as I mentioned, just in that view only mode. At the bottom of your screen, uh, you can uh, interact with us by hitting the raise your hand tool. So uh, what I would like you to do maybe now is if everyone can hear me okay, please go ahead and raise your hands. Yep, yep, yep. Perfect. That is excellent. I see a lot of hands going up. I'm going to lower your hands now. Uh, thank you for that feedback. There's uh, another function and next to the raise hands, uh, you have a Q&A panel. Uh, this is how you can ask your questions uh, as we walk through the sessions. Uh, I do encourage you to ask your questions at any time during the webinar. So no need to save your questions up until the end. Just uh, if you have a questions, go ahead and get that entered and we will get it answered for you. So the, the webinar is uh, recorded and we will send out a link uh, to the video via email. So no, without further ado, I'm handing over to Bruce, our product developer here at Spirec with more than 15 years experience in the field. And uh, so please, I'm just gonna hand this over to you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, great to be with you all today. Thank you for your attendance. Um, I'm just gonna switch on a pointer a laser pointer here so it's a little easier to see on the um, on the screen and these are the topics I want to cover today so we're uh, what we're talking about is uh, primary treatment for wastewater treatment plants or also intake systems potentially for drinking water plants or cooling water systems that sort of thing anything involving uh, screening systems and then uh, dealing with uh, screenings washing and compaction grid capture and washing, storage and transport. And when I say storage, I mean a, a particular um, uh, system uh, called our Spirotainer, which you may, may or may not know about, but will uh, you will by the end of today. And um, then uh, packaged inlet work systems. So uh, larger systems where we, can plot, where we supply all of the components, including stainless steel channels and uh, structural elements and things like that. And um, um, so, let me get started on, um, uh, we'll start at the beginning of a plant. So uh, there's a couple of ways that we can deal with incoming wastewater from a, uh, for a wastewater treatment plant. Um, you can deal with it with a single screen potentially, uh, which would be a fine screen, which does all the heavy lifting for the system, or you can deal with it by having two, uh, two layers of screening, which is generally our recommended method because it, uh, um, the first screen or the core screen gets rid of the larger objects. It'll handle things that may, uh, may get caught in a fine screen system. They may be too large, they may be too heavy, uh, but a core screen will handle those nicely and clear out anywhere from 20 to 80% of your total screening. So depending on how you select that first screen will determine how much of the lifting the, um, the fine screen has to deal with. 
Um, there's a few options for course screens. The rate guard is, a, um, is the first option I wanted to talk about. It's a robust screen uh, that allows you to deal with uh, gravity or pump flow. Um, if you have large pumps where you may have large objects coming down the screen, down the stream, uh, this is a perfect screen for that because it handles um, heavy objects and it can handle obscure things like uh, uh, car parts, for example. In the UK where we do a lot of these systems, we see uh, um, things as big as a car door coming through the system and this screen is suitable for being able to remove this uh, that type of object. It consists of uh, tapered profile bars. So along the grid face of this screen, there will be a series of parallel bars, um, which are uh, typically 12 millimeters wide and they taper back to six millimeters uh, in the direction of flow so that uh, materials will get held up on the front of the bars, but not held at the back of it. Um, it can provide a 10 to 25 millimeter gap and that will determine how much screenings you get picked up at the, at the primary uh, screen rather than the secondary screen. Um, there's a mechanical rake that's on an actuated arm system and linkage system here. So this uh, rake travels down to the bottom of the screen when the water level starts rising and it, uh, a series of combs fit in with the bar grid and these combs are raked up the face of the screen and then the screenings are discharged over the back of the screen into a conveyor or some uh, a launder, depending on what your system looks like. Um, and there's a, a polyethylene wiper blade that clears the blade, so it clears the rake. So this rake typically sits up above the channel until the demand is uh, demand signal is is received, and it pushes down to the bottom, and then it starts dragging screenings up to the top again. Um, it's got a, an actu electric actuator in here, which actually pushes the teeth of the rake into the screen so that you get a very positive, uh, assured removal of screenings. And it's also got a, um, um, a memory system and um, um, that allows the, the grid to push out around an object. So if you have an object that can't be moved, it will try three times to lift that object. If it can't lift it, it will move out and go around it and it'll map that and it'll go up to the top again and remove the rest of the debris. So the next time down it will avoid that object um, and it will raise an alarm to say that there's something in there that can't be removed. So this is for systems that are gravity fed uh, or where you have the potential of getting a very large heavy object in there. But um, this is a very robust system. This can lift up to uh, several hundred kilos so there's very little that can really get uh, held up on that. The um, next type of screen I want to talk about is a chain guard core screen. So this is probably a more commonly applied screen. It's a simple uh, device and it consists also of a bar grid very similar to the, um, uh, to the previous, to the rake guard. Um, again, it has uh, wedge shaped bars that can create a 10 to 25 millimeter wide gap. And similarly, these can handle, these will capture about 20 to 50% of the screening's volume um, coming in. So if you get rid of uh, large rags, um, anything that's got any size to it will get picked up on this. And the way these operate is that there's a, um, uh, there's a chain system on, that goes around the front of the screen, goes up and down like that, and along those chains is a series of comb plates. So these comb plates travel down the face of the screen, uh, um, upstream of the uh, of the screen and then they turn around a guide frame at the bottom and then they travel back up the face of the screen drawing up the screenings with it so that's where the interface occurs with the uh, the comb and the screen itself and it draws the screenings up and then discharges them over the back um, so these are uh, uh, there's no wash water required on these there's no brush this again has a wiper blade and is a very a uh, reliable and simple mechanical system for removing that first layer of screenings. These can only go down to 10 millimeter spacing. So they, they can't be the only screen that you have in your system, but uh, they certainly can be the first screen. So these would feed into a conveyor or a launder system. And um, um, that would then go on to a, a spiral wash unit or, or something similar. The feature of both of these screens is they have low head loss. Um, anywhere from 50 to 150 millimeters. They've got a large free area, and that makes them um, uh, suitable for a like, first line of defense for your plant. 
Um, these can be quite large, um, up to eight meters in, in depth uh, for the channel. So here's a couple being built in the factory in the UK. So these obviously are for uh, big channels. And the photo is a little hard to see, but you, here you can see the, um, the bar with the teeth on it uh, meshed in with the grid plate. So uh, these bars move along the grid and um, clean the screenings out from between the, the bars of the grid. And here you can see it on the top where it's coming back towards the bottom of the channel. Um, as an alternative to those, the, we can also use what's called a step guard or a step screen. Now, um, step screen is different from those types of screens in that uh, they consist of much thinner plate. So these are three millimeter wide plates. There's a set of uh, uh, steps, if you like, that are fixed and a set of steps that are um, moving. So the moving steps travel in a circular motion and what they do is they lift screenings from the bottom of the um, screen to the top by kind of walking it up. So they walk it a step at a time, the material will travel up the face of the screen and um, these benefit from having a very high uh, free area. So uh, if you have three millimeter bars in this, as we call them bars, um, and six millimeter gap, which is quite typical, that gives you 66% free area. So um, what that means is that these can be the smallest screens possible to fit into a channel. So these will fit in very compact spaces and have high flow rates through them with low pressure drops. They're not a, uh, they're not a perfect screen because they don't have a, uh, they're a, a one dimensional capture. They're a slot instead of a, an aperture. Um, so some material will get through if it's long and stringy, but uh, a properly operating step screen will remove about 75% of the uh, material in the, in the channel. Um, they can, if they're used in a coarse screen mode, um, they will remove about 50% of the screenings, the difference being the way that you operate them. And I'll, I'll get onto that in a bit uh, more. Um, these are typically installed at 55 degrees. So between that slope and the, the step profile in here, you can remove quite large objects. They'll travel up the face of the, um, of the screen. So a tennis ball, for example, will sit on there, travel gradually up the face of the screen quite uh, comfortably. Um, all of the screens we've looked at uh, cover about the same range of capacity in terms of flow rate, of anywhere up to about 2,000 liters per second for a single screen. And um, um, these can handle a channel about four meters deep and up to two meters wide. I mentioned the way that these are operated. So um, this is this particular screen is being operated as a final screen. And you can tell that because what the way the operation is set up is to allow a mat of material to build up on the face of it. So with this mat of material, um, that provides a secondary screening capability above and beyond what the uh, spacings of the bars will provide. So this will give you up to about 75% capture of screenings. And uh, whereas if you ran that continuously, so continuous stepping instead of um, stepping and waiting, you would only remove about 50% of the screening. So there's two ways you can operate these. Um, so if this is a final screen for your plant, then um, the, the concept is that you have an ultrasonic level sensor or some sort of level sensor or switch upstream of the screen. Once the water level builds up, you take a couple of steps. So it steps once, twice, three times. And what that will do is provide enough clear opening down at the bottom of the screen to let more water through but it will also let water continue through this built up mat of material on the face. And the advantage of that is that it captures a lot of the finer particles. So this is a very effective and, and like a cost effective way of um, removing about 75% of the, um, the debris from your, uh, from your channel. Then we get into the um, sort of the more sophisticated, the higher efficiency type of screens. So the band guard or the uh, or band screen is just that. It's a screen that comes in anywhere from two millimeter to six millimeter perforations. And I'm going to deal with two millimeter perforation model separately uh, because it's a different design of unit. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, so what we're talking about here is typically a three millimeter to six millimeter perforation unit. Um, these have plastic panels. Um, they can fit in a small, uh, a narrow channel because they, they sit in 
uh, sideways in the channel, if you like. So the water comes in the front of the unit, travels into the inlet, and then travels out both sides. So it's a dual, we call it a, um, uh, a dual flow traveling screen, and it's in to out type of flow. So in to out means that it travels into the center of the band, and then the water continues out both sides of the, uh, of the band leaving behind the screenings on the band. The band itself rotates within the, the assembly and the screenings get lifted up to the top where they're uh, discharged into a uh, launder trough. Um, these are very effective at removing, uh, there's very little carryover with these. Anything that doesn't get picked up by the, uh, by the, by the uh, plates in here will get left in the uh, inlet chamber, um, but most things will get picked up. Um, if you don't have a, a screen upstream of it, a coarse screen, then there may be things like stones or larger objects that can get hung up in there. But for the most part, um, most things will travel up the screen and get removed. These suffer somewhat from being a higher head loss unit because of the perforations, especially as you get down to small perforations. Um, it's common to see head losses up to 400 millimeters at uh, peak design flow. So that needs to be taken into account. Um, the, but the efficiency of these is very high. Uh, we have uh, uh, these tested at the National Screen Evaluation Facility in uh, the UK. Um, our three millimeter model has come out to be 95%, which is the best on the market, and six millimeter is at 85%. So you can see the range of options that you've got to go from 75% up to 95% capture rate. You don't really want to go much beyond 95% capture as you're, take, you're starting to take out too much organics, even though the organics will get washed back from the, uh, from the washing unit later on. Um, it's probably better to leave some of that in the stream. So this is about as efficient, as high efficiency as we want to achieve. But this will protect any downstream membranes or MBR plants that you might be looking at, uh, give them the optimum level of protection. These are stainless steel or carbon steel construction. Um, the the uh, plates themselves are made of uh, polyethylene, high, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And um, uh, that allows them to be light. And that way we can build these to deal with up to eight meter deep, or sorry, up to 20 meter deep channels. So these things can be quite massive, um, really uh, the length of a 40 foot container to drop into some deep, deep channels. We don't see them very often in Australia like that, but uh, from time to time we come across them. Um, these have a, a feature in that all the servicing is done up above the coping level of the channel. Um, so all of these panels are removable and um, there's no need or very little need to do any servicing down within the channel itself. These are just some views of the, um, how they sit in the channel. So you can see water flow goes in the center of the channel and then travels either left or right as it enters and goes through the screen and the band is traveling around like that. Again, it's not a continuous operation. This looks at a level sensor similar to the step screen and it just activates the, um, uh, the, the gear drive to turn the band whenever the water level coming in reaches a certain set point. You can see it here in plan view. So the water enters the front, goes through, and then continues on downstream. And another view here, uh, just to make it a little, uh, a little clearer. Okay, some of the componentry within the, uh, the band guard. Um, you can see here the, uh, the plastic panels in the bottom. These are the perforated panels that, uh, uh, that actually do the uh, lifting on this. Um, there's side seal plates. Uh, the chain goes around uh, this polyethylene guide in the bottom. So because we have no sprockets underneath, um, the only surface items are really these, uh, um, these guides and the seals that go around the edge to ensure that there's no bypass material uh, that, that can slip through the, um, uh, between the parts. You can see the shape of the uh, inlet chamber here. So these panels rotate like that and carry the screenings upward. You can see on occasional <clears throat> panels, there are teeth that stick out. So what these do is they pick up screenings that may have collected in the, um, in the inlet chamber and they'll carry up uh, uh, bundles of screenings up to the top and discharge them into the uh, launder. So this is what the band looks like when it's removed. And um, so quite a simple operation, quite easy to understand. There's a couple of exploded views here that just give you a slightly better idea of what the parts look like. 
So you can see the, the van itself is turned by a sprocket system that sits up on top. And then the, uh, the van follows these side seals down, as I mentioned, to ensure that there's no bypass of screenings to get into the downstream channel. When the, um, the van comes up to the top of the unit, um, there's a spray water spray bar in here that uh, sprays from the outside to inside and into the launder channel. So um, this sprays, um, it, you should usually use um, final effluent on this. It can be, as long as it's uh, screened to, uh, or filtered to 500 microns, it's fine to be able to uh, um, push through the screenings into the discharge. Um, one of the features of the three to six millimeter band screens is that they have no brush on them. They rely on wash water only to, uh, to clean off the, the screens. Um, for that reason, in places where uh, wash water is unreliable, and we see this a lot in the UK, they tend to um, use the NYX type of screen, which has a, a brush cleaning system on it, and instead of just relying on spray water. Um, so what will happen is if you have a failure of the spray water system, the screenings will still stay inside the unit. They'll stay inside the van. They won't travel downstream, but they'll start to build up on the face of the panel. And once the water comes back on, that will all get washed off again, but it'll take some time to clear. So you want to be sure that you have reliable uh, RE plant water to be able to uh, keep the screen uh, clean. Where this differs or where we have a different design is on the two millimeter unit. So two millimeter being a very difficult uh, screen to clean because the holes are so small. And if we relied on, on uh, spray water to clean the, clean the apertures, um, we wouldn't be able to achieve a, uh, a completely clean screen. So what we've done with that is to redesign the unit. So it now becomes an out to in design. So water travels on the outside of the band into the inlet and then through the and out the discharge and the screenings travel up the outside of the screen and they're washed off at the top um, again a spray through the through the from inside to outside now and a rotating brush that goes on the top so this is like a car wash brush that sits up on top and it wipes off the face of the screen and knocks uh, knocks all the screenings down into the discharge so that's only on the two millimeter screen it has to be specially designed to be able to handle that the such fine openings and be able to uh, be assured of getting them clean but for three to six millimeter uh, openings it's more this arrangement with the spray water uh, wash cleaning assembly this is just another view of what the uh, the panels look like so these are the perforated panels here again these are uh, um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Umpy, I think is the easier way to say that, but um, I may just call it PE or Umpy. Uh, these are the side seal uh, mechanisms. So this um, sits against the frame to form a side seal. And these are the chain sprockets. So this gives you an idea of what the assembly looks like. And I think there's an exploded view here to uh, break this into parts as well. And I talk about all the nuts and bolts that go into it. This is meant to be more of a training session or a educational section than it is a, a product uh, session. So um, I'm not going to go into much detail on that sort of thing. Okay. Um, the third option as far as uh, perforated screen types is the called the fine guard. So the fine guard is a different concept from the band guard. Band guard sits uh, parallel with the flow. So uh, when you make those screens bigger, you make them longer. So they sit in the channel and they can go up to four meters in the length of water flow. So they can sit in a narrow channel and um, the water comes in, turns, and then goes out. So you have, uh, you have the ability to, make, uh, to take advantage of a long channel to fit those in. The fine guard, on the other hand, is completely different. It sits perpendicular to the, um, to the stream. Um, this is more like the step screen in terms of uh, its orientation. So it sits at a steep angle in the, um, in the channel. And instead of bars uh, being down in the, uh, in the water, we have perforated plates. Now, these ones are stainless steel perforations instead of being plastic. Uh, the reason for that is that these have to be stronger. Um, and weight is not such an issue on these because we, don't, we, we, we can't build these to a 20 meter depth. We can only build these to about a four meter depth. So, um, they have different applications and they can go quite wide up to three meters wide. So there's a lot of water pressure that uh, can develop on the face of the screen, especially once it's um, 
uh, completely built up with screenings on it. So we have to make sure that the panels are strong enough to be able to uh, withstand that. Therefore, they have to be stainless steel. Um, the concept is that the, uh, this is again like a band in that uh, we have a series of panels that are on um, uh, chains along the edges. The chains travel along guides on the bottom of the screen and again around a sprocket at the top. So there's some similarity to the, uh, to the band screen in terms of the concept, but it turned 90 degrees to the, um, to the channel instead of being uh, parallel with it. Uh, these have three to six millimeter diameter holes. We can't do this in a two millimeter uh, option, uh, but these are the most common type of screens that are applied in the UK, for example. In Australia, we see quite a few of these as well, but uh, we have a, uh, uh, more of a mixture, I think, within Australia. In the UK, probably 95% of the um, fine screens that go in are of this style. And the reason for that is largely due to the, uh, to the brush on these. These collect screenings on the exterior of the screen, so a brush can be employed to clean the screen, um, similar to the two millimeter band screen that we spoke of. So instead of having to rely solely on uh, wash water to clean them, um, it uses a, a brush first, followed by a spray wash uh, system second. These are similar efficiency to the band screen, 89% for, the, um, um, for the three millimeter, and that was versus 95% for the uh, band guard. So quite a similar uh, screen capture efficiency. Again, very suitable for MBR plants or um, any uh, plants where you really don't want to have any debris getting downstream aside from the organics. Uh, let's try the graphics here. Um, this is showing the unit from the back again. So you can see that you would have water coming in the front and the water now can turn and travel out the side, similar to the band screen, except it's not uh, traveling through a screen at this stage. It's coming out through an opening in the side of the frame. Um, on both sides. Some water will travel through the back of the uh, screen. So this screen travels um, uh, upward, gets cleaned at the top, and then travels back down again. On its way back down, the screen is cleaned. So any water coming through will not remove any debris from there. Um, but this, um, the fact that you're putting water back through this um, it would remove screenings if there were any to be captured on there. So it's very important that uh, uh, these elements up here are serviced to ensure that uh, um, no screenings can get past the unit and downstream. And these are some of the um, uh, components of construction. So um, these elements on the side are again to provide a sealing mechanism. In the bottom of these units, um, there's a brush system in here. So there's a rigid brush on a rubber flap. What that does is it allows teeth to come through. So in, uh, on occasional plates, we have these teeth. Um, so these are debris removal teeth that uh, lift screenings or they lift long rags or um, any kind of debris that will hook onto those. It'll uh, lift that and carry it up the face of the screen. These are only on occasional panels. We don't want them on every panel because those uh, have a wear effect on the, uh, on the brush assembly. Um, but in order for them to be able to travel around the bottom and come up again, they have to uh, travel through this brush here and that prevents any screenings from being able to pass through. So it's quite a clever system to ensure that uh, nothing can get through the, the screen and downstream. Uh, this shows a cutaway view of the cleaning mechanism. So the screen as it travels over the top sprocket comes in contact with the, uh, I, I call this a car wash brush because it's a big, it's a big brush. Uh, it's not terribly aggressive, but it's uh, just enough to be able to remove the screenings. And then anything that's stubborn or gets, uh, isn't removed by the brush is then uh, gets a second chance of removal by the, uh, by the spray wash on here. And these things don't operate continuously. They, uh, they'll cycle the same way as the step screen did with the, uh, based on upstream water level. Or, or a differential across uh, between upstream and downstream. So these will cycle on and they'll run for 30 seconds to remove screenings and then they'll sit and wait for the water level to build up again, for example. Um, and those times are all based on, on experience at the plant and screenings load and, uh, and they get tweaked over time to uh, come up with an optimum uh, cycling. I think there's a cutaway, yeah, a bit more of a cutaway view on here that just gives you some idea again of the componentry that goes into these. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into nuts and bolts on that, uh, but you can kind of see how it fits together. Oops, one more. Okay. Um, it takes us to really the last uh, type of screen that would be commonly available or commonly suitable for this type of application. Um, and this is a rotating drum screen. So this is a completely different principle from the other ones. Um, this consists of a, of a drum that's uh, made of uh, perforated steel, uh, or the drum can also be made of a, like a, wet, uh, a mesh wire. So uh, because it's in a drum arrangement or in a circular arrangement, it gets great strength from the hoop strength from, uh, from being a cylinder, uh, which means that this can be very thin. So these screens tend to be very thin and these can go down to two millimeter. And in fact, uh, if you have a woven mesh style of, uh, of drum, you can get down to 0 0.5 millimeters uh, of aperture size. And uh, most plants don't require that level of screening, but there are instances where that might be required. So it's nice to have that option. Uh, most typically these would be two or three millimeter and uh, these sit down in an angle in the channel so the water comes in the back end of them and it travels out through the bottom of the screen so the amount of screen that's actually doing work on this is very small because most of the screen is up and out of the channel but as it rotates um, the screen becomes wetted and the wetted part has water traveling through it and it uh, picks up material the material travels around and up and there's spray washes at the top, the spray bars um, that spray the material into a trough in the middle of it. And within the trough is a uh, conveyor, uh, a screw conveyor that transports the material up to the top and discharges it. So um, the same gearbox that drives the drum also drives the screw conveyor. Uh, so that's a very simple way of, of removing screenings, rotating the drum and cleaning it. So. Um, Quite a simple operation, one moving part essentially, but then a lot of parts in contact. Uh, the disadvantage of these, this design, I suppose, is that you need a relatively wide and shallow channel to be able to uh, operate. And uh, uh, so you, you can't have a deep, narrow channel. Uh, it, it just, the geometry of these just won't allow it. Um, they're quite effective at uh, removing debris and transporting it. And, uh, because of the amount of surface area that's involved in this, you have very low uh, head loss through these. You have a lot of surface area for the water to be able to travel through, and um, you get very little bypass. There's a, a sealing mechanism that goes around the frame and the um, rotating drum. Uh, so this is quite um, uh, resistant to any bypass material. One of the downsides to these is that uh, because it's a rotary motion, if you have long, um, snakes of screenings, uh, towels, things that have sort of uh, bound together over time in your piping systems, and they come into here, they can tend to wrap around this uh, assembly in the middle. They may not get picked up properly. So you have to be wary about what type of uh, plant this is going into and whether it's vulnerable to that type of uh, um, debris coming through. If you have that situation, Often it's better to have a, uh, a coarse screen upstream, to get rid of the big challenging pieces. And this is perfect for picking up like the, the leftover 50% down to 20% of screenings to, uh, uh, for your final, uh, final stage. And this is a couple installed in uh, situ. So you can see they have, uh, this is in a, a stainless steel uh, built channel. And um, we have a video of the system that gives more detail and uh, I'll talk about that later. Okay, um, that was basically our large systems or our, um, uh, our I suppose our bigger wastewater uh, uh, package systems. Then we have some components that are, uh, are some systems that are for smaller plants, pumped flow applications. These may be for smaller towns or they may be for remote installations. Uh, and this is our spiral guard family. So um, this first one is a, uh, what we call our compact cleaner uh, CC unit. So these are for smaller flows up to 150 liters per second, uh, or they can go higher, maybe up to 200 liters per second. But they're for um, screenings only. So we, we pump water in the top of these. It uh, travels through a screen that goes up the middle of this. And there's a spiral conveyor in here that transports screenings up through the discharge and out the top. So water just flows through, through the screen, and then out the uh, discharge on the bottom. These have one moving part. It could not be a simpler device. 
they operate again on a level sensor which sits inside the tank. So once the water level starts to build up, it will rotate the screw and remove the uh, screenings up to, up to the top. Uh, they can also have a press head on the top so you can dewater the screenings and uh, put them straight into like a long opaque bag or into a skip um, or into a spirotainer, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, these are very easily accessible, easy inspection, easy maintenance, and uh, so they're perfect for uh, remote plants, for example. We also have versions of these for septage removal. So if you've got septage trucks that are bringing in uh, more challenging materials, uh, we have a more robust version of this, which is, uh, uh, has lower flow rates, but then has uh, more sophisticated controls on it and more robust type of design. Here's a cutaway view of it so you can see the uh, conveyor inside um, with the screen and these screens can be um, like a narrow wedge wire down to 0.5 millimeters of uh, gap space or they can be down to two millimeters of screen as well so we can get very fine screen effects from this. So this is about the most economical way to, uh, uh, to handle a uh, primary treatment plant. This is not designed in this this element by itself does not handle grit removal, um, but we have a bolt-on section that comes downstream in our combi guard unit. So these will handle uh, wet screenings up to three cubic meters per hour. And uh, uh, if you put a press head on the end, you can get 80% um, weight reduction and 60% volume reduction uh, through that. So um, quite an effective way of, um, of dealing with uh, uh, small wastewater flows. And here's one in situ. Uh, this one has a, a press head on the, um, on the end of it and dumping into a skip. So again, very simple operation. Ultrasonic level sensor um, sitting on the top of it um, to activate the uh, spiral whenever a, um, uh, once you get to enough water level with inside. Um, our channel screen is a similar uh, concept. Um, except it has no tank. So what happens here is that the, um, the it's a conveyor assembly that sits down into an open channel and water flow travels along and travels through the screen, deposits its screenings onto the face of the screen, and that gets pulled up along the spiral conveyor again and discharges into a uh, skip pin once again. These are a pulling arrangement, so the gearbox and the drive assembly and the coupling disc and everything is up on the top of it. Um, so this keeps everything out of the water. Again, one moving part. The advantage of the, uh, the previous unit, I'll just go back one step, um, because it's a pushing gearbox, you can put a, uh, a press head on the end of it and you can get very good compaction on the discharge of that unit. Uh, whereas on these, because it's a pulling drive, um, your screenings will not be quite as dry as they will be coming out of a uh, compactor unit like that. We see this in a lot of different applications, not just wastewater plants, but pulp and paper industry, wine industry, food industry, uh, abattoirs, that sort of plants. Uh, um, like these systems, they're quite inexpensive, quite reliable, and they're easy to service. Uh, there's a number of different arrangements for uh, brushing. So the screen is kept clean by the spiral riding on top of it and having this nylon brush that uh, sweeps along at, a, at low RPM. Um, in this instance, we've got a brush on the leading and trailing faces. We have removable brushes or weld-on brushes. Uh, and here you can see what happens on it. This is a perf screen down below. So um, screenings are coming through and getting picked up and traveling up the, uh, up the spiral, as you can see here. So quite an effective and simple design. Screenings, washing, and compaction. So uh, we've dealt with all our, our getting the screenings out of the channel or out of the pump flow. Then what do we do with the screenings after that? So this is what the uh, next step of the process is. So this is a uh, spiro wash, washer and dewaterer, or a spiro press dewaterer. So um, these two are uh, have a similar concept. Um, but a better effect is achieved by the uh, spiro wash unit because this has a, a washing cycle to it, whereas the spiro, I mean the spiro press unit uh, simply has a compaction um, element to it. So it will reduce the volume of screenings and squeeze water out, uh, but it won't wash anything, won't wash out the organics aside from what will escape with the loose water. So this will give you a much cleaner um, um, uh, output from your uh, from your dewaterer. Um, 
the spiral press unit uses a door on the discharge to provide back pressure and it, it has a plug in here. So a plug forms in the end of it and that plug is where the force is imparted back on the spiral and that creates the compaction. So the door is there to, to start the plug forming. Once material has built up in the end and a plug is formed, that plug becomes the resistance to adding more material to it and that's what squeezes the water out of it. So the spiral continues to turn push material into the plug and eventually part of the plug will discharge out the door. Um, whereas on the spiral wash unit, the back pressure is achieved by filling a discharge tube up with screenings. So we have an elbow to start with. So we have to push the screenings around the corner of this elbow and up a, a lift to a bin. And um, that length of screenings and the plug and the first elbow in particular or what impart the back pressure onto the spiral in this case. These are also a, a, a stronger spiral. We put in a, a core in the middle of the spiral to give it additional strength and to prevent any material from traveling backwards. And um, that allows you to have a really firm, um, firm plug dewatered and clean. So in the middle in here is the washing uh, system. So there's a press zone in here where we inject water in. Uh, we push the screenings back and forth a couple of times, wash the organics out of it, and then compact them, and they will travel gradually up the discharge tube into a, uh, a bin. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size of these, so these are uh, go up to a size 365, so the 365 is a measure of the, of the tube diameter or the spiral diameter because it's about the same, and uh, these can handle up to eight cubic meters per hour of incoming screening. So quite a high volume in quite a compact unit. Um, and we call this one in particular a compact unit because it's got a very small wash box, uh, rinse box on the bottom or drain box. Um, so incoming screenings come in here. Uh, the initial water that's with the screenings will drain out through this box and then uh, the screenings will travel along, will inject more clean water in with the screenings into the press zone and it'll discharge out the end. Um, this is suitable for screenings applications where you're using a conveyor to feed the screenings in, so it doesn't have a lot of loose water. If we, if we were dealing with a launder system where there's a lot of free water coming down the, uh, down the pipeline and coming down the launder into the inlet, uh, we would have to have a larger inlet on here to drain away all that uh, loose water that's carrying the screenings. Uh, so a couple of different design subtleties to, uh, to that. Uh, these units can be close coupled onto various types of screens. So this is the back of a stepped guard screen. So uh, the screenings come get lifted up the top, get walked over the back and drop down into the uh, spiral wash unit here as it sits right over the channel. So a very uh, compact and close coupled system it doesn't have the discharge pipe on it yet, but that's uh, because it's um, not finished yet. This typically would have an odor shroud over the top of it so that uh, you have a, it's not a perfect airtight seal, but this would typically be, have an odor connection on it such that you're uh, maintaining all of this at a negative pressure. So uh, very compact arrangement, quite inexpensive. Here's a more sophisticated version. So this shows a band screen with a launder feed. And this is, talk, this is uh, then uh, going into the same spiro wash unit, except this has a long drain box on it, like I was talking about. So that allows for drainage of a high volume of free water or wash, the wash water that actually transports the screenings. So that can be up to about four liters per second coming through here. So the spiro wash unit has to deal with a lot of loose water, and it does so by having an elongated uh, drain deck on it before it gets into the compaction zone. So you have uh, large discharge uh, pipes on the bottom because there's a lot of water coming through here and discharging back into the, uh, into the channel. So in, this is somewhat of an unusual uh, installation in that we don't have a, uh, but a, a lot of linear travel for our discharge pipes instead of vertical travel. Um, so we have to have our first initial bend to uh, be able to impart the back pressure on the, um, on the screenings plug. And what that will do is it will allow a plug to form and we expand as we go. So because the screenings travel very slowly and they will dry somewhat of their own accord and expand as they move along, we have to flare the discharge pipe. So the, the pipes will flare at a couple of points so that screenings do not get um, 
bound up along the way, and then they'll get pushed along gradually. And in this case, they're discharging into um, what we would call a screening discharge box, if you like. And in this instance, because these plugs can be quite hard and rigid, um, and it's got to turn a sharp corner to drop down into the pin or the spiral retainer below, we need to have a mechanism to be able to break those plugs off. So here you can see that we've got um, pneumatic actuators in here. These act like a guillotine inside the, the uh, screenings box. There's a, um, there's a knife uh, blade in there or a, uh, a bar across there that slices down through the face of the plug, knocks it off to allow it to drop down into the um, into whatever's uh, sitting below. You'll see that is quite a common arrangement. We've got uh, dozens of installations around Australia that look, uh, look just like that. So all very close coupled together, the band screen right beside the uh, spiro wash in this unit sitting on top of the channel. Uh, here's one that's a little more spread out. So we've got a um, um, we've got two units side by side, and these are our larger units. So these would be 365. So that's a large diameter pipe you can see on there. Um, so this handles high volumes of screenings, up to eight cubic meters per hour. So that's a lot of screenings. These get compacted down to 80 to 85 percent volume reduction. So that eight cubic meters coming in only ends up being maybe a cubic meter per hour or so traveling out. It will re-expand if we break the plug up a little bit uh, when it gets downstream, so it may end up being more like two cubic meters per hour. Um, but you can imagine that um, uh, handling screenings of two cubic meters per hour, after a day, you end up with a lot of screenings. Um, so these plants are designed for peak loading systems, very rarely that they would handle and uh, provide, create two cubic meters per hour for 24 hours a day. These operate intermittently. Um, a uh, unit this size with two cubic meters going out the end of it might do five or six cubic meters in a day or, or maybe up to eight, something like that. So um, very intermittent operation according to the demands of the plant. And so this is similar to what we were talking about earlier. This has a shoot block sensor up here just in case uh, something fails within the uh, spiral wash unit and screening start backing up here. Um, but the, we drain the loose water off the bottom. Again, we travel around that first bend. In this instance, we've got quite an aggressive bend here. And what that means is that we will get very dry screenings out of this unit because it's, uh, it takes a lot of force to be able to push it around that first bend. And that's what drains the water out of it. These plugs can get very hot. Uh, these can often be hot to the touch. A lot of force is involved in, uh, in achieving this uh, um, forming of the plug. And uh, in here we have access doors and when we first started this plant we had to reinforce these access doors because the, they were bulging out because of the, uh, the pressure created by the plug. So these units uh, impart a lot of force and that's why the screenings when they come out um, are, are very dewatered, they're clean and they're, uh, they're light and fluffy so uh, the transport costs are kept to an absolute minimum. In this case we've got a lot of lift happening so we're traveling from here up about four meters to the discharge. Again, we've got a screenings box on the top, and that's where we transition from horizontal flow to vertical flow. And again, we've got a plug breaker on the top. So not all systems have this. It just depends on the geometry, the layout of the uh, discharge tubing, uh, which can be completely variable and bespoke. And you can see in here the, um, the tapering of the um, discharge pipe. So we're expanding that all from front to bottom to accommodate the uh, expansion of the screenings as they uh, travel up the, uh, up the discharge pipe. We have a, a bifurcated chute here, so we're dropping screenings either into conveyor A or conveyor B, sending them on their way probably to a spiral retainer. Uh, this is, um, this is a, the previous, uh, another view of the previous slide that I showed where we're feeding from a, uh, a band screen into a conveyor. So in this instance, uh, we're draining off our, oh, sorry, this is a new site, this is a different site. Um, but in this instance, and the reason I've got this slide in is to show a different way of draining off the loose water. So in this case, we've got a conveyor at an incline. So this has the drain box on it here. So we're discharging our four liters per second of water into the inlet of the conveyor, draining off the loose water. Then the screenings are transported up and dropped into the spiral wash units at the top. So the spiral wash units don't have to deal with the um, the volume of water. They just handle screenings that have been 
um, not dewatered, but the, the loose water has been removed from them, drained off. So that's why these can be a more compact unit. You don't need the big drain box under the bottom of them. But again, these uh, have a, an aggressive first band, travel upwards, and in this case, you can see how they're feeding into a spirotainer. And uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about spirotainers in a few minutes. Again, these have a plug breaker. Um, it seems like all of our systems look like they have plug breakers on them to uh, break shear off that plug. In fact, most of them don't. It's, uh, most of them can feed directly into a, a conveyor or into a spirotainer. It just depends again on the, um, on the ge geometry of the plant. Okay, we also have a, uh, an, an additional degree of washing. So, um, the spiral wash unit gives you a certain level of cleanliness of the screenings, but it's not perfect. You wouldn't want your kids playing with this stuff. So um, we have a second layer of, uh, of screenings washing, which may be required if you have sensitive landfill areas that just don't want any odor. I don't know that those exist necessarily, but we do have demand for this from time to time where the screenings have to be more odor free. They may want to uh, store them in open skips and they don't want, um, uh, they don't want uh, flies around um, so we can take it to another a higher level of washing. So this is like putting a washing machine on top of the inlet to the spiral wash unit. So there's a, a impeller that sits in there on a, a powerful motor and it beats the crap out of the screenings that are in there. So it, uh, it's like a super aggressive uh, washing machine. You would not want to put your clothes through this. They would end up in shreds. So um, it will break up paper. If you have uh, like an A4 pack of paper that goes through this, it'll end up, it'll go downstream most of it because it ends up as, uh, as fiber essentially. So this is an aggressive way of cleaning screenings, but you do get the greatest volume reduction and you get the greatest uh, cleaning effect of your screenings. So uh, this is a type of screenings plugs that end up coming out of this type of washer. Um, the ones in the back here were the ones that were before they had the, uh, the washer turned on. So uh, you can sort of see the difference. So these are almost unidentifiable as being screenings uh, plugs and they'll be uh, quite light and, and fluffy. Okay, uh, Spiropress dewater, we spoke enough about that already. Uh, we have a wide range of sizes and capacities. So these can go up to quite high throughputs up to 30 cubic meters per hour. Um, and um, again, these do not have the same washing capability as a spiral wash unit, but they're suitable for many different types of applications, industrial, food processing, uh, food waste, that kind, of, um, that kind of thing. And just some shots of uh, the uh, constituent components. So in this case, we've got a wedge wire basket. These come either in wedge wire or a perforated thick walled basket um, to press out the, uh, the water. Uh, and then here's the spring, the spring door. Okay, uh, that's the end of the screening section. So we're on to uh, um, grit vortex unit now, or grit systems. So there's several um, uh, processes or components that Spirac have to be able to deal with uh, removing, washing, and transporting grit. So probably the most commonly applied one would be our grit vortex system. So a grit vortex system is a, is a system for dealing with uh, um, water in a channel that's been, uh, had the screenings removed from it. So water comes down, uh, travels through a tank around a circular pattern, and then discharges out 270 degrees and continues on downstream. The concept is that the uh, water is full of grit. The grit can be up near the top surface of the water, the lighter grit. And what this does is it, gives, it has two um, methods of removing the grit. The first is centrifugal force. So as the water travels around, the denser particles tend to keep traveling in a straight line, end up against the wall in a uh, boundary layer, and they will travel, they will fall down the wall and collect in the sump at the bottom. The second method is just simply gravity. If they're not dense particles, if they're lighter particles, they may not travel by centrifugal force, but there's enough residence time in here that they will drop down and fall into the bottom sump anyway prior to getting to the discharge. So the key elements of these is that we have enough residence time to be able to ensure that all of the particles, or at least all of the particles below about 150 microns, uh, are able to drop down and end up collecting down in the bottom sump. 
So this unit would operate without any hardware attached to it at all. Just a uh, cement concrete tank in here, you would end up collecting screenings, I mean, uh, grit down in the bottom here that you could pump out of there. So that would be a semi-effective grit vortex system. The reason it wouldn't be fully effective is that um, the impeller in here is there to keep the organics suspended. So if you don't have this impeller in here, the organics will tend to also drop down under gravity flow, especially under part flow conditions, and they'll end up down in the sump. So you get a lot more than you bargained for down there, and you'll end up with a, a thick slurry of grit and, um, and organics that when you pump to your classifier, uh, bog it down. So that's why we have uh, the rotating impeller assembly, and that's what the vortex effect is. So as this rotates, it creates vortices within the, uh, the chamber, and that keeps the lighter particles suspended long enough that they get down to the discharge uh, end of the tank. It rotates quite slowly, 15 RPM, and the, the simple beauty of this, I suppose, is that um, because it's rotating in the same direction as the water flow, as you reduce your water flow under part load conditions, the amount of vortex effect that is created becomes higher because the, the velocity of the water becomes lower as it travels through here. So a greater residence time, which would normally mean that you would settle out more particles, but because you've got greater vortex effect at the same time, you keep your fraction very similar between what gets separated and what gets retained. So it's a, a self-regulating system. It's very simple. It doesn't need any uh, fancy controls. It just works on a time function. And um, uh, it's as simple as that. These can be made out of um, concrete. Most of them, the, especially the bigger ones, are made of concrete. These tanks can be up to eight meters in diameter and handle up to around 3,000 liters per second. Smaller units can be made from stainless steel, so we can build them in our factories, ship them out to site. They can go as a single piece or to be bolted together, and we're only limited by shipping uh, volume, so, or shipping size. So we can ship, I think the largest ones we've shipped are about four meter diameter. So that might handle four or 500 liters per second um, in a stainless steel unit. So the advantages of stainless steel obviously is that you've got a, a plant, you don't have to have all the civil works involved in uh, pouring. There's a lot of concrete volume involved in this and it's a permanent fixture. But if you put a stainless steel tank out there and the associated channel work with it, then that becomes a, a system that you can move later on or you can expand it. Um, you, there's all kinds of things that can be done with that uh, later on that the concrete obviously won't allow for. Um, the only tricky parts of the vortex systems are to deal with uh, removing the grit. So there's three basic ways of removing the grit from the sump in the bottom. You can use a flooded suction grit pump. So that sits down below the channel level. It's always got a head of water above it. And it's simply a matter of turning that pump on and this pump may run 30 minutes every 24 hours. Uh, it may run like two or three minutes at a time, three or four times in the morning, three or four times in the evening, a couple of times during the day. These are very lightly loaded systems typically, depending on what the grit loading is like. So the concept is that you turn on a fluidizing line first. So this can be just plant water or it can be um, amped up with a, uh, a small pump and it's just handling clean water. So it's a very inexpensive pump. What that does is stirs up the grit that's settled in the bottom of the chamber, and that allows the pump to extract it and discharge it into a classifier or a grit washer. Um, these are grit pumps, so these are special uh, pumps that allow, uh, they have hard impellers that are uh, resistant to wear from, from grit particles, and they're belt drive because they're, um, um, they're, they're a wide, they have a, a wide inlet to them whereas these are a direct drive and are quite a small, uh, low, low motor size pump. Um, Self-priming pump, similar concept, except that the pump sits up on top of the channel. So this is more common in your um, concrete plants where you're, where you're below grade with your tank. Um, so this has a priming chamber on it, so it keeps full of water so that it can start each time and have a primed, uh, uh, a primed start. It doesn't have any false starts that way. And instead of the line going in the side of the uh, chamber at the bottom, the line now goes through the center pipe of the impeller. So this tube down the middle is hollow and we can put other pipes down the middle of that and they are not interfered with by the uh, rotating assembly here. So in this instance, we've got a, 
an extraction line that goes down and just sits down at the bottom of the sump and we've got a fluidizing line that goes down beside it. So that sends a jet of high velocity water down into the sump, churns up the grit into a, into a, um, um, into a what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, fluidizes it. <laughs> um, and then that allows you to be able to turn on your suction pump and extract it. The third method is an airlift system. So the airlift system is a slightly different arrangement where we have a, a high pressure, like a rotary load blower in here that blasts air down instead of water. So what this will do is it will send a blast of air down into a, a, a small line and that air will travel out through a collar that goes around into a larger line. That's the extraction line. So the air uh, travels into the extraction line, forms bubbles which travel upward, create a lift, and that creates a suction zone at the bottom. And that lift is what draws out the water grit slurry and sends it off towards the classifier. So uh, the way the blower works is a, a three-way valve here switches over between fluidizing and extraction, and that allows the grit to be lifted up. And um, it has a limit to how much head it can, it can provide. But if, as long as your classifier is not uh, too far above the channel, and you know, very often they're down below the, uh, the top of the channel anyway, so it's quite easy to uh, transport it this way. Um, the advantage of these is that there's no parts, no moving parts in the wetted in the stream. So you don't have the, um, the maintenance that you would have on a grit pump, which always has uh, wear parts in it. So this has a completely open line. All it's seeing is air, water, and that's and sand. Grit. Uh, so these are a couple of uh, grit pumps, very often supplied in uh, duty standby arrangement. This is a view down into. Um, it's not operating yet; doesn't have very much water in it. But that's what the uh, impeller looks like bottom, down in the bottom of a uh, of a sump. So below that is your, uh, um, is your sump, which is either a meter or a meter and a half in diameter, depending on the size of the unit. Okay, an alternative method, uh, and I won't talk too much about this because this tends to be for the larger plants. And so we see these in bigger markets and overseas markets, but we can apply them in smaller applications as well. And that's uh, aerated grit chambers, where the method of grit removal is simply gravity and time. So water travels in a big tank, big swimming pool from one end of the tank to the other. And as it travels uh, from one end to the other, it drops grit out, which uh, settles down in the bottom. And we have a slowly rotating screw in the bottom. This one's 35 meters long, so these things can be enormous. And it draws grit back and it pulls it and discharges it into a, a sump. And there's a pump uh, that then pumps it out and into a classifier. Very simple application. We provide the troughs, which are cast in place. So these can be smaller, um, but typically they get used where economy of scale allows this to be an effective way where um, it's beyond the range of traditional vortex systems. So these might be up, upwards of five, six, 10,000 liter per second plants. Um, they're aerated to keep the organics from settling out. So when you aerate the tank, the, the organics travel around in a, a circular pattern. Uh, without settling out. So that just keeps the water moving as it travels from one end to the other. Uh, what happens to the grit after it leaves the vortex or the uh, grit chamber? Uh, we collect it in a, in a Sansec grit classifier. Very simple device. It, uh, we feed in our inlet stream, our grit slurry in the front. Um, it's got a residence time in there which allows the grit to settle out and gets removed very gradually by a slowly rotating um, uh, shaftless screw conveyor and discharges into a skip or bin. There's a little washing effect with these. We can put uh, spray bars or sparge lines on these to uh, get a little bit of washing, um, but these are not the same as a grit washer. The water travels out over a weir at the back of the unit, so the water that you have now goes into the channel downstream and is delivered without any uh, grit in it. So very simple, one moving, uh, one moving piece and very commonly applied. A shot in the field. Uh, alternative to that is a grit washer. So this is a much more uh, sophisticated unit and it imparts a washing effect on the grit. Um, so it brings in grit in a batch form and collects it down in the sump of the, of the grit washer and we pass a counter flow of clean water up through the grit 
And we have a, a stirring assembly in here, an impeller, if you like, that's slowly rotating. And that um, creates a washing effect within the, uh, within the grit washer. And so what happens is the, the sand that sits down in this chamber down here goes through a batch wash cycle. And once it's finished that batch, it gets transported out through the grit screw and another charge of um, grit slurry comes in, actually comes in tangentially, um, allows the grit to settle out onto the top of the previous charge of grit, water flows over the weir and discharges. And through a sequence of um, uh, timing cycles, we open an organics outlet. So what that does is it decants the organics that have been washed off the grit. So it gets rid of those in a separate screen rather than trying to dump them out over the weir. And that allows um, a full range of, of uh, organic densities to be able to be handled in this unit. So what you end up with is a, um, a clean discharge of sand out the bottom and into a uh, dumpster or a spiral wash unit. There it is in, uh, in real life. Um, and there's various controls. These are a little more sophisticated. They work on a pressure switch system or a, a uh, pressure uh, sensitive sensor down in the bottom that can detect um, how much sand you've got in the tank, how much water you've got in the tank, and it will put it through its various cycles according to that. So a um, little more sophisticated, but the driving force on that is still a time cycle uh, uh, interlocked with the, the grid pumps that are feeding it. Spiral retainer that I've uh, previously mentioned. So these get applied for um, primarily uh, screenings, number one, grit number two, and sludge number three, meaning in terms of the um, common usage of them. These are very suitable for screenings because they have a high volume. What they are is a self-filling bin system. So connected to a conveyor system or a discharge pipe from a, a spiral wash unit, these fill in the inlet of the unit. Uh, screenings come in and they um, hit the conveyor here. The conveyor transports them along and they will drop out according to where there's space. So the first set of screenings will come and build a mound here, and then additional openings, they'll, the, as the mound builds and blocks off that first opening, it, the mound will move along right to the end until it gets completely full as detected by an ultrasonic level sensor at the end. Um, so these are fully contained. They're completely odor tight and sealed around the door. They have a very sophisticated uh, closure system, not like a normal uh, dumpster or skip bin where you have uh, where water will leak out of them. These will not let water leak out of these out of them. So you could fill this up with water and have a, um, a robust seal on the end of the door because of this ratchet mechanism that we uh, we have on here. That's very important for if these are traveling down the freeway on the back of a, uh, a truck um, and somebody's following it in their convertible. They don't want to be getting a, a face full of um, spray that's come from a wastewater treatment plant. It's most unpopular. Um, so uh, these are odor tight because they have a sealing system. So they've got a, an inlet here, which is attached to a retractable chute. And once the chute is retracted, a gate is closed to lock off, um, to make this uh, airtight. And then it's picked up and taken away to the, uh, to the landfill. So as I said, these can be employed for screenings or grit, uh, either together or separate. So they can be mixed and um, dumped in or they can be um, for sludge removal as well. We have some plants that prefer to use this rather than trucking out sludge. So these go up to 20 cubic meters, which is suitable for, um, for being able to remove uh, um, sort of 18 to 20 tons of sludge at a time and having a, an expandable uh, storage system on, uh, on a site. I've talked about most of that already. Um, and these are some uh, in situ shots of them. So you can see they get uh, connected in series by means of these retractable chutes I was mentioning. And the retractable chutes above them have a slide gate. So that allows you to fill this uh, spiral retainer or this one or this one, depending on which one is full. And uh, this makes your plant expandable. In this instance, they've got an emergency skip bin at the end of it. So a bin would sit under here so that if all of these spiral retainers were full, then the screenings, or it might be sludge in this case, I'm not sure, but would go on to the, the final bin as an emergency. And so these spiral retainers are picked up on a maybe a weekly basis or two weekly basis, or maybe a daily basis, depending on the, uh, uh, the demands of the plant. 
and taken out to landfill and removed. The one thing you have to be wary of is that the bins always have to come back to the same plant or to somewhere else, to another plant by the same company that also has uh, spiro tainers. They can't go back to the, uh, to the trucking company like you can with an open top bin. But these are completely odor contained. So these conveyors here, this whole system will be under an odor, con odor control system. So all these odor pipes here are connecting into the conveyors. The conveyors have a, a pathway that leads down into the top of the spiro tainers. So by imparting a negative pressure on this uh, conveyor up here, being that it's a shaftless screw conveyor, you can also impart a negative pressure on the spiro tainer down here. So totally odor controlled these sites. You can walk up to these plants and not know what the, um, what the ingredients are inside because you can't smell anything. So uh, very popular and um, especially in high residential areas. Uh, they come in stainless steel variety as well. This is just them on a transport truck. This isn't how they get taken to the uh, landfill. That would be done by a, a, a hook truck mechanism. Um, this is a similar plant, but these ones are used for sludge applications. So this is wastewater sludge, dewatered sludge, maybe 20% DS, and 20 cubic meter silo, uh, spiro tainers, which get picked up by um, uh, hook lift trucks. And I'm gonna show you a video that explains that whole process rather than me trying to uh, explain it in words. These sit on uh, load cells in this instance, so they know how much uh, uh, the trucking company can charge them for, uh, for the load that they take. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. Watch this video. Okay, <clears throat> the video was short. I couldn't have talked fast enough to explain all of that, but I think it was pretty self-apparent how that uh, operates. Um, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to uh, write them in and we can, uh, we can deal with them at the end. We're coming to the end um, shortly anyway. Um, next uh, topic, and I think this is the last topic, is packaged inlet works. I won't go into great depth on this because there's so much detail potentially on these, but this is a um, Spirac has become very good at doing package plants where we provide a, a, a turnkey primary treatment plant for a site. And uh, this can be um, shippable units. So this is uh, what we would call our combi guard unit, which consists of a gr long grit chamber and a uh, screenings inlet section. Or it can be a built up system where we use multiple components. So in this case, we use multiple uh, CC units, um, there's a, vort a stainless steel vortex system and a grit washer, um, all feeding into a skip in this case. Um, this is a video of uh, Murani water wastewater treatment plant. I think this one has sound, so let's, I'll just let you listen to a better voice than mine. Spyrac, innovative solids handling solutions. This is the Murani Preliminary Treatment Area, supplied to the Mackay Regional Council and designed by Spirac. The prefabricated plant removes solids and grit from the incoming sewage. The new Murani WWTP has a capacity of 2,300 kilolitres per day of raw sewage. Manual Bar Screen. In the event of an emergency, or if no fine screen is available, Raw sewage shall be diverted to a manual bar screen. The wastewater flows through the bar screen where large solids will be collected. The screening will need to be scraped into a removable tray which can be hoisted up through a hinged lid and discarded. SpiroGuard The SpiroGuard combines screening, conveying, dewatering and removal of solids from the effluent stream and accommodates 100 litres a second each. 
Raw sewage gets pumped into one of the three spiro guards, which work in a duty, assist, assist configuration, and remove solids larger than two millimetres. The sewage runs through the perforated screen, which captures solids bigger than two millimetres. The shaftless conveyor transfers the screenings to a wash and press zone to remove excess organics and dewater them. Grit Vortex the grit vortex from Spirac separates high-density grit particles from lower-density organics. The grit is then transferred via the installed grit pump in the form of a slurry from the grit tank to the sand wash. Sand wash. Sand wash is designed for those applications where any visible organics on the grit is unacceptable. The sand wash grit washer utilizes a multi-stage cleaning process to remove organics and other larger lower density objects to be returned to the downstream biological treatment. Spirotainer. Spirotainer is an autofilling containment and road transport system designed for the hygienic and automatic handling of foul or objectionable waste materials. Extending system capacity is as easy as adding another spirotainer. Okay, th that guy's voice is so much better than mine, I think you'll agree. <laughs> um, I think that's the end of... Oh yes, okay, sorry, one more. Innovative solids handling solutions. The Serena Water Recycling Facility is located in Queensland, Australia. Spirac was asked to design and supply a prefabricated package treatment plant. The solution provided is supported on galvanized steel beams elevated approximately 5 meters above ground to enable flows from the drum guard fine screens to the grit vortex. During the screening process, the raw sewage enters the inlet chamber and dissipates the energy of the incoming stream. In the event that neither fine screen is available, raw sewage passes over a screen emergency bypass and gets rejected. Each fine screen channel contains an electrically actuated penstock upstream which will be closed when its corresponding fine screen is in standby mode. The two drum guards work in a duty standby configuration to remove solids larger than 2.0 millimeters from the incoming flow. As soon as the sewage level reaches a predetermined level, both fine screens will be running. Screenings are separated from the liquids transported when discharged to a horizontal shaftless screenings conveyor. The conveyor transports screenings to the spiro wash via a drop chute. compacts and washes the screenings before depositing them into a bin. Screen sewage passes from the fine screen channels to the grit vortex unit. The grit vortex separates high density grit particles from lower density organics. The grit is then transferred via the installed grit pump in the form of a slurry from the grit tank to the sand wash. The sand wash washes and separates the grit and transfers it to the combined screenings and grit bin. This completes the prefabricated inlet works solution. For over 40 years, Spirac has created reliable, trusted and cost-effective solutions for screening, grit and sludge handling. Spirac, innovative solids handling solutions that work. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love those videos. I should have played those at the start. I could have saved you all a lot of time. Anyway, um, that brings us to the end. And uh, all that's left is if you have any questions or anything you want to um, talk about. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I think I will go ahead and uh, take some time to answer some of the questions that I saw coming through.
let me just uh, navigate up here. All right. Uh, okay, is there a risk of ragballing? All right, I got to figure out what. <laughs> where, 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 where so that was at 12.49. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I addressed that the, the rag balling is a risk on the uh, there's there's some units that will tend to rag ball more than others so rag balling um, is there's potential for that in a um, band screen because if it doesn't pick up the rags for some reason I mean the hooks should pick them up but if they it is possible for you to uh, get a, a, a ball of rags developing there it's not common uh, the ones that are common would be the uh, if you put in a a fine guard across a channel at a steep angle, you can get some uh, rag rolling occurring in there. Um, the most susceptible ones are probably the drum guard, uh, where you, because you're turning in a, a rotary motion, you can get uh, ragging in that. To minimize the rag balling, again, uh, the coarse screen will solve that problem entirely. Uh, to help it out, we'll give is to put in the longest straight run of, of channel that you can before the screen the rag rolling is um, uh, exacerbated if the water is coming in unevenly to the face of the screen. Okay, we have uh, Kent D asked, uh, does the fine guard use significantly less wash water than the band screen? Uh, yes, the fine guard, because it's got a brush, most of the washing is done, uh, or most of the uh, cleaning is done by the brush, so it definitely uses less wash water. Uh, it's not relying solely on the wash water. Band screens can get quite long in the direction of, um, of water flow. So the longer they get, the more water that is uh, required. So definitely. Okay, Mr. Coomer asked, uh, can a 45 degree bend incorporated at the outlet of the chute where plastic, et cetera, discharged to the bin? Uh, that was at uh, 14. I'm trying to think when that was. Uh, outlet of the chute. Must I could think maybe with the screening compaction in the press tube because the yeah if uh, certainly uh, if that if you're talking about spiral wash unit definitely we can do 45 degree bend um, um, we can do a, a combination of multiple bends as long as we're smart about it and don't get try to get too aggressive so we can go around corners. We can do 45, 30 degrees. We just can't go quite to 90 degrees on our, our bends. Okay, and then there's another question. Is there an overflow inlet where bypass in case of a 100% clocked screen? Um, I'm not sure which slide that's, in, that, that's uh, pertaining to, but in most cases we would have, most of our systems have an overflow bypass weir. So that can be either a static or an adjustable inlet weir. And, um, Usually the water is bypassed then into a manual a bar screen or something like that, or there may be some other mechanism, so quite common. All right, then uh, next question would be, uh, what is the water pressure required to wash the screen? Yep, should have mentioned it. Uh, it's about three to five, so minimum three bar to five bar is required. Okay, and then uh, last questions by the look of it. Uh, how how would you prevent screens uh, getting stuck near drive and on drum screen? Yes, well, that's a uh, an ongoing issue, and I'll reiterate that a core screen will solve that problem entirely. If you don't have a core screen and you want to do all your screening by the drum screen, then you have to know what your plant is receiving, and if it's receiving a lot of long, uh, long and winding screenings, if you like, then that's going to be a constant maintenance consideration because there's no real easy way to prevent that aside from having a secondary type of or a primary type of screen in front of it. There's questions coming in trying to uh, let me scroll down on this hold on I'll just uh, get the pointer here. So, okay. so and the last question Will these slides be available? Yes. Uh, Peter can answer that one. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so the we're gonna uh, because we recorded the session and uh, a part of that recording is going to be the PowerPoint in there as well. I mean, if you uh, Cassandra, if you just want the PowerPoint by itself, you know, I'm more than happy to share that with you as well. Uh, but as I said, you know, the recording uh, includes the PowerPoint presentation slides. Um, so I think. Uh, it looks like we covered all our questions. Um, 
Was there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? No, I'm tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, there is no more questions coming in. I think we're good for now. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure being with you today. Um, maybe just uh, a few things. Um, first of all, of course, we appreciated it, uh, your time. And uh, to our listeners in Queensland, we hope to see you at our exhibition in WIOA in Logan. Uh, it's uh, beginning of June. Uh, this, as mentioned, this session is recorded. So you, um, if you have provided your email address, you will receive an email in your inbox with a link to the recording that you can use to watch again or share with your colleagues. Um, so I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, however, if you have any remaining questions, do not hesitate to reach out and uh, our team of engineers uh, will respond to you. You can do that under info at spyrec.com.au or uh, uh, just give us a call under 0894340777. That quite was a bit quick. I mean, you can get that from the website as well, which is www.spyrec.com. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day.